I'm very grateful <coughs> for this opportunity to participate <coughs> in something so unusual, so far so enjoyable, and I'm also grateful to God that I don't have laryngitis this morning because I thought I was going to just sit here quietly and listen to Dr. Logan. I couldn't talk very well last night. I don't like debates, especially with friends. And since we are brothers and sisters in holy baptism, in the faith of Christ, which was brought out so beautifully by our last two speakers and co-heirs with Christ in the eternal union with the Father, it hardly seems appropriate that we should be debating. I particularly was unhappy when I thought I signed up for a debate and now learned that I'm in a dialogue. I thought it was a debate when I, I was wondering how I ever said yes. Um, because in my life I preached in about 200 Protestant, Lutheran, and Anglican churches and always have had a beautiful reception and have been able to share faith. Also, I live in a neighborhood where I'm surrounded by saintly Protestants. We live in a neighborhood called Fort Apache, and near we also have a friary in the center of Harlem. And all around us are these dear, saintly, old African-American people who are Baptists and Church of God in Christ and Pentecostals. And I talk to them all the time and we're great friends and I find in them marvelous spirituality and humility and love of Jesus Christ. So I would hardly want to be debating with them. But as our previous two speakers pointed out, there are differences to be ironed out. Now, with this particular group, you have to know that we've got a very different situation. Dr. Logan was never a Catholic, and I was never a Protestant. <laughs> oh, you were? Oh, he was a Catholic. I didn't know that. I thought you got this name Logan as a Scots Presbyterian. Well, that makes it a little bit different. I didn't know that. So I was born a Catholic and have always had great positive relations with many different kinds of Protestant friends. I have to tell you that I'm going to be quoting considerably from the fathers of the church and the very early fathers of the church on the interpretation of the New Testament texts on the Holy Eucharist, especially on the Synoptic Gospels description of the Last Supper and the Sermon of our Lord at the multiplication of the loaves and fishes in John 6 and St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 10 and 11. I'll be using a lot of quotations from the Fathers. These quotations are in my new book in the presence of our Lord, the theology, psychology, and history of Eucharistic devotion. If you, you don't have to buy the book, I ran off some papers with the basic quotations on them. And you can pick those papers up at the table outside with my name on it. I think it's obvious that good Christians can read about the Last Supper, about the words of institution, about the powerful words of St. Paul on the Eucharist, that when we celebrate it, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. I think it's obvious that many people of good will can read these texts and come up with different interpretations. That's obvious. And 
rather than argue about the texts, I'm going to take a little step that Mr. Bowman took before me, and I'm going to quote authoritative interpretations. For the Catholics were not too familiar with the different Protestant statements of faith, mostly from the 15th and 16th century, like the Westminster Confession, that Mr. Bowman uh, used. I'm going to do the same thing, but in this case, I'm going to use the very, very early church, the very beginnings of the post-apostolic period. Some of these writings were written when presumably some of the apostles were still alive, particularly John. And look at these statements because they are key to understanding not simply the Catholic interpretation of the Eucharist, but also the Orthodox. Almost anything I say today would be acceptable to Orthodox theologians. You must know that about 75% of the Christians in the world follow a teaching on the Eucharist that it is a sacrifice, a sacrament containing the body and blood of Jesus Christ and his presence. This would be Roman Catholics, Eastern Rite Catholics, who are about 10 million people, who are not Roman Catholics, but they are in union with the Pope. There are probably some Melkites or Ukrainians here, Ruthenians, Maronites, also Eastern Orthodox Christians, and some of those churches that are so old that they're not called Orthodox, they're called Apostolic, like the Antiochian Church and the Armenian Church. Basically, all of these people, 75% of the Christian population of the world, believes that the Eucharist is a sacrifice, a sacrament, and the real presence of Jesus Christ. And the reason they believe this is because it was the faith of the very ancient church. And some of you may not be familiar with some of these people. We call them the fathers of the church. They are responsible for giving us the New Testament. It was they who decided what ancient writings were inspired and belonged in the New Testament. When Jesus rose from the dead, when he ascended into heaven, he didn't hand them a New Testament. The final lists of the approved books of the New Testament came around the, the very end, well, around 398, very much in the East, under the impetus of St. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, and in the West, under the impetus of St. Augustine at the Council of Carthage in 398. And in fact, it is St. Augustine who is responsible for including two books which were doubtful up to that time and which Protestants happened to love, the Epistle to the, uh, the, Epistle to the Hebrews and the Book of Revelation. Now, one of these very, very early fathers is St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch. He died in 107. He died a martyr, and on his way to Rome by ship to be thrown to the lions, he wrote epistles to the same churches, some of the same churches that St. Paul wrote to, like to the Ephesians, and to other churches along the way. In his epistle to the Romans, he wrote, I take no pleasure in corruptible food or in the delights of this life. I want the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who is the seed of David, and as drink, I want his blood, which is his incorruptible love. In his epistle to the church at Smyrna, St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote, uh, 
Observe well those who are heterodox in respect to the grace of Jesus Christ that has come to us. See how they are opposed to the mind of God. Charity is of no concern to them, nor are the widows and the orphans or the oppressed. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered for our sins and who in his goodness the Father raised. To the church in Philadelphia, he wrote, be careful to observe only one Eucharist, for there is only one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ and one cup of union in his blood one altar of sacrifice, as there is only one bishop with the presbyters and my fellow servants, the deacons. And basing uh, his teaching on 1 Corinthians 10, 17 and his letter to the Ephesians, he urges the Christians to have only one assembly, this means not to break up, led by one bishop with the quotes, with the breaking of the bread which is the medicine of immortality, the antidote against dying that offers life to all in Jesus Christ. Obviously, the Eucharist was very, very important. Now this opens up a question, and I'm going to interrupt my discussion of the fathers to raise this question right off the bat. And the question is, how in the world do you understand what he is saying? How do you understand the words of Jesus, this is my body, not this bread is my body, but this is my body, this is the cup of my blood. And may I state categorically and emphatically that you can not understand it, it is a mystery. And the reason that much of the world has problems with the Eucharist is because it has problems with supernatural divine mysteries. Christianity is built on the mysterious. The Holy Trinity, one God, three persons, a personal God, this is mysterious. Can you imagine anything more mysterious than a single person with two natures, divine and human, and that person is a divine person, so that it is true to say that God is born among us, that God suffers, that God dies, and that God rises from the dead. Absolutely mysterious. Saint Melito of Sardis, a martyr in the second century, says, God was murdered. You want a mystery? Saint Augustine says, in the Gospels we see omnipotence become tired, eternal beatitude weep, and life itself die. Mystery. And I'm, I, I am most distressed, and Mr. Bowman, referred to this distress. He referred to it as liberalism. I would, I would intend to call it rationalism. The absurd and stupid, unprovable, unproven, and easily disproved idea that the human mind can understand all things that can be perceived by the senses. I spoke last night of the mystery of gravity. Nobody knows what gravity is. It's a natural mystery. Nobody knows why that happens. Light, life, time, matter, all of these things are natural mysteries, the origins of the cosmos. And beyond them are supernatural mysteries, the mystery of God. St. Augustine in the Confession says, far be it from me, O Lord, to think that you think like I think. Because if there was a mind so great that it knew all things that ever had been or are or ever shall be, surely we would fall to silence in the face of such a mind. 
But far be it from me, O Lord, to think that you are such a mind. For that mind would think like I think when I sing a song. I could remember what I sang, I know what I'm singing, and I anticipate what I will sing. But you, O Lord, you do not think in that way. For to you, all things simply are. And for you, there is neither today, nor tomorrow, nor yesterday. All simply is. And through your today, pass all tomorrows and become all yesterdays. We must be ready for mystery. Cardinal Newman writes this, and it's terribly important. If I must submit my reason to mystery, it is not much matter whether it's a mystery more or a mystery less. When faith in any event is the essence of all real religion, when the main difficulty for any inquirer is to firmly hold that there is a living God in spite of the darkness which surrounds him, the creator, witness, and judge of all, when once the mind is broken in as it must be, to a belief in a power above itself, when once it understands that it is not itself the measure of all things in heaven and on earth, then that mind will have little difficulty going forward. I do not say it will or can go on to other truths without conviction. I do not say that the mind ought to believe the Catholic faith without grounds or motives. But I say this, when once the mind believes in God, the great obstacle to faith has been taken away, a proud and self-sufficient spirit. When once a man really with the eyes of his soul and by the power of divine grace recognizes his creator, he has passed a line. He has bent his stick neck, he has triumphed over himself. And he if he believes that God has no beginning, why then not believe that God is three in one. If he believes that God created space, why not also believe that he can cause a body to exist without dependency on place? If he's obliged to grant that God created all things out of nothing, why doubt his power to change the substance of bread into the body of his son? If there is no way to approach the Catholic teaching on the Eucharist except by the understanding of mystery. Any believing Protestant, any Orthodox, any Catholic must have a sense of divine mystery when speaking of the Trinity or the Incarnation or many other things. To discuss the Catholic teaching on the Eucharist, it also has to be in, uh, uh, taught and understood in the framework of divine mystery. Dr. Hahn mentioned Matthias Joseph Schaben, S-C-H-E-E-B-E-N, one of the greatest theologians of modern times, much overlooked. He's author of a book called The Mysteries of Christianity. And Schaben writes, the greater, the more sublime, the more divine Christianity is, the more inexhaustible, inscrutable, unfathomable, and mysterious its subject matter must be. If its teaching is to be worthy of the only begotten Son of God, if God had the Son of God had to descend from the bosom of the Father to initiate the, us into this teaching, could we expect anything else than the revelation of the deepest mysteries locked up in the heart of God? And who says it better but St. Paul? Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways. For in who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? With that in mind, we approach the Eucharist. And I could talk to you for five days and not exhaust the mysteries of the Eucharist. But I did say they are mysterious. And let me go on now with some of the very earliest fathers. 
St. Justin Martyr was a lawyer. They call him the apologist. He's one of the first people to get into great religious arguments. And in his writing around the year 150, he writes, in explaining Christianity, he says, the food we call the Eucharist, which no one is allowed to share except the one who believes that our teaching is true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins unto regeneration, and so lives as Christ has handed down. For we do not receive these as common bread and common drink, but just as Jesus our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so likewise we learned that the food over which the thanks has been given by the prayer of the word, which comes from him, the word thanks in Greek is eucharistain, which we get the word eucharist, when that prayer of the Eucharist has been said, which comes from him, and by which our blood and flesh is nourished through a change, by those words, this bread becomes the flesh and blood of the same incarnate Jesus. For the apostles in their memoirs, they were not yet called gospels, composed by them, have handed on to us what they was commanded them, namely that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks said, do this in remembrance of me, this is my body, and having taken the cup and given thanks said, this is my blood. St. Justin is particularly clear when writing to Typho the Jew that this celebration of the Christians is in fact a fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi. And I want to find that if I can do it because uh, it leads to something very important and I should have had this clear. This is in the dialogue with Typho. He's writing to him, a, 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 he's a, a mythological Jew, he made him up. Concerning the sacrifices once offered by you Jews, God, as I have already said, has spoken through Malachi the prophet, who was one of the 12 minor prophets. Quotes, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord. I do not accept your sacrifices from your hands, because from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name has been glorified among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense and a pure sacrifice are offered to my name, because my name is great among the Gentiles. Just, uh, and then Justin goes on. Already then did he prophesy about those sacrifices that are offered to him in every place by us Gentiles, speaking, that is, about the bread of the Eucharist and the cup of the Eucharist. So here, Ignatius of Antioch in 106, Justin Martyr around 150, says that the bread and wine in the ancient church are believed to be the flesh and blood of Christ and that they are a sacrifice. That's terribly important because these are among the very, very earliest writers. In the book called the Didache, there is a description of an early Christian service and it is so close that you could use it as a description of the sacred liturgy or what is popularly called the Mass. Saint Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon, born around 130, had listened as a boy to the preaching of Saint Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, who had been baptized by Saint John. And he was talking against the heretics and he said, Vain in every respect are they who reject the entire dispensation of God and deny the salvation of the flesh and spurn its regeneration, saying that the flesh is not capable of incorruption. But if the flesh is not saved, neither then did our Lord redeem us by his blood, nor is the cup of the Eucharist the communion of his blood or the bread that we break the communion of his body. 
We could go on. I could mention dozens and dozens of citations from all of the fathers of the church. There is not one father of the church, not one of the people responsible for the eventual certification of the books of the New Testament as we know them. There is not one of those people who denies that the Eucharist is really and truly, that's the words they use, the body and blood of Christ. St. Irenaeus goes so far as to say, when you receive communion, be careful that you do not drop a particle because what falls to the floor is the flesh of the Son of God. At the end of the persecutions, the church, of course, came out of the catacombs and there were now great scholars who were fathers of the church. St. Ambrose, Archbishop of Milan, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. St. Augustine wrote five million published words in Latin, about seven and a half million words in English. Along with reading the Bible every day, I have read the writings of St. Augustine every day since I was 14 years old, and I have gone to Holy Communion almost every day since I was 14 years old. I read St. Augustine all the time, and perhaps that's why I get along well with Protestants, because Martin Luther was an Augustinian friar, and because often St. Augustine is quoted by the Reformers. St. Augustine writes in his sermon on the 98th Psalm, he took earth from earth because flesh is from the earth, and he took flesh from the flesh of Mary, he walked on earth in that same flesh and gave that same flesh to us to be eaten for our salvation. And furthermore, no one that eats this flesh unless he has first adored it by a profound bow or a prostration avoids sin. We do not sin when we adore him in the Eucharist, but we do sin when we do not adore him. This is an extremely powerful quotation. Many of the writings of St. Augustine and the other fathers were translated by the Presbyterian divines and the Anglican divines in the 19th century in Edinburgh and Oxford, great libraries of the fathers. When they get to these lines in Augustine's sermon on Psalm 98, they leave the lines out and put in three dots. The lines were that intimidating. St. John Chrysostom, Archbishop of Constantinople, who died in 407, says, how many people say to me, I want to see Jesus' shape, his image, his clothing, his sandals? Behold, you do see him, you touch him, you eat him, you want to see his clothing, he gives himself to you, not to be just seen, but to be touched, to be eaten, to be received within. Beware lest you yourself be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. They killed that all holy body. After so many graces, if you receive him with a stained soul, what about that? What purity should have a man have who enjoys this sacrifice? Now, it's mysterious, and the mystery comes from the very words of Christ. This is my body. He doesn't say this is a symbol of my body. He doesn't say this bread is my body. Sometimes Catholics, Orthodox, sometimes St. Paul will refer to the Eucharist as the bread. This bread is the body of the Lord. But Christ himself does not say that. He says, this is my body. It's not unusual for Catholics or Orthodox to refer to the Eucharist as the bread of angels. I should mention also the Anglicans would do this. Now, here is a very, very interesting thing. 
and it must be behind your mind. Why in the world such an unusual miracle? Jesus says, I will be with you to the end of the world. The great theologian Shaban, following on St. Thomas and St. Augustine, says that we see a progression